So uh, I'm excited to be here uh, and chat with you all about neuro-oncology, uh, which is clearly the best subspecialty in neurology you probably just don't know yet. So um, according to the outline that Genevieve and Maggie asked me to do, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own journey um, to get where I am now in neuro-oncology. And then I'm going to talk to you about neuro-oncology specifically. Uh, I'll try to give a pretty broad overview about the specialty so that you can get a sense of what my day-to-day -day looks like. Uh, and then I've left a lot of time at the end for questions uh, because I want to make sure that uh, you know, people who are here who have interest uh, have the opportunity to ask. So um, I'll just sort of start at, the, at a relevant beginning, which is med school. So you may or may not know um, one in six uh, people in the United States will be impacted by a neurologic disease. And my family was unfortunately no different. So I had a very close personal connection to brain tumors going into medical school, uh, which really sort of made me think very early about brain tumors, keeping my eyes open altogether though. Uh, and uh, as a result of that personal exposure, I did seek out early and several uh, exposures to neurology with electives and so forth, and really just loved the diseases and the content and the patients, uh, and importantly, the neurologists. Uh, and so really began to find my way uh, during that med school time. And I, I thought it would be interesting to just sort of tell you what I did on the side during all this stuff too, because it actually has paved my way for a lot of what I'm doing in life. So um, during my med school, I spent a couple of years doing research um, in my free time, quote unquote, uh, at, at MD Anderson. I was, I was training in Houston uh, in a brain tumor immunology lab, just to again, try to further my exposure to where I thought I found interest. And then I also, uh, worked in political advocacy. So I was in Texas, uh, and Texas thinks it's its own country, uh, as you may or may not know. So they have an enormous um, medical society, Texas Medical Society, uh, and I also worked in AMA. And I was an officer in my local chapter, and I was a delegate sort of head in the national um, arena in terms of AMA. So I, I was really very involved in advocacy, and I continue to um, think that that was a very important early exposure for me uh, and has driven a lot of what I've done. Um, in residency then, I, I uh, made the huge move to Dallas uh, from Houston and really spent a lot of time uh, trying to get general neurology exposure. Um, you know, neurology is an incredibly broad field. I'm sure that a lot of you know in many ways, it's not terribly dissimilar from internal medicine, which has cardiology and pulmonology and allergy and immunology. You know, medicine, uh, neurology rather, has stroke and ICU and multiple sclerosis and epilepsy and neuro-oncology and a variety of different other things. And so I spent a lot of time trying to have a broad understanding of neurology um, because I knew that whenever I subspecialized, uh, I would need all of that information. Uh, and then during residency, I also uh, served on the Graduate Medical Education Council for UT Southwestern, sort of representing neurology as a field. I was a chief resident while I was there. And the program is relatively small, but I did get as much exposure as possible to neuro-oncology during my residency as well. During this time, uh, it wasn't until I was a resident really that I came to find uh, the American Academy of Neurology. And really started to spend a fair amount of time um, working with the AAN at that time too. I was the president of the uh, Consortium of Neurology Residents and Fellows, which really gave me a great opportunity to learn about the academy and to meet lots of other neurologists and neuro-oncologists um, from around the country. And then um, med school's busy, uh, residency's crazy busy. So uh, I, the research I did wasn't lab-based. Uh, it was primarily quality improvement, which is a lot, you know, chart review type of research that I was doing um, sort of after hours during residency. And then uh, for fellowship, I made the move up to Boston. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the neuro-oncology fellowship at the end, but I spent about two and a half years in fellowship because they just decided to hire me. They couldn't get rid of me. Um, and so the first year of the neuro-oncology fellowship for me was patience, patience, patience. Um, although 
you should never feel um, hesitant to ask questions during life as a physician. Uh, in many ways, fellowship was sort of the last hurrah of times in my silly mind, uh, where it was like totally fine to ask as many questions as possible. Whereas once you're an attending and you're sort of, you know, the expert, um, it doesn't feel right to ask 20 questions for every patient you see. So um, I just saw as many patients as I could and read as about, about as many patients as I could um, just to have a really broad understanding of the field. And then uh, in the second year of fellowship, I it, it, second and then the half a year after that, I sort of um, spent a lot of time in a research lab. So I was doing pipetting and genotyping and uh, working in a cell signaling lab, um, really to try to speak a language I didn't speak. I came into this without a PhD, as you noticed. Um, and I wanted to be able to have um, informed conversations with colleagues who were uh, involved in, in basic science. And so this was really, um, just like somebody in college might take a, a, a semester abroad or a year abroad to sort of broaden their horizons about a particular topic. This was my sabbatical, so to speak, where I went to the lab and I was purely lab focused for a year and a half doing all this research stuff um, in, in neuro-oncology and loved that. Um, I also did some quality improvement research during that time uh, to make sure that I continued to have a good pulse on clinical care uh, while I was otherwise sort of pulled away. And then uh, there was a program for uh, dummies to get an easy master's of public health um, in the Boston area that I uh, thankfully was able to take a part, take a part of um, and got a master's of public health focused on clinical effectiveness. And this was another attempt um, from my perspective to try to learn a language I didn't speak. Uh, I, I did not have a very strong statistics background going into uh, medical school or residency or fellowship. And so coming out and now recognizing I was going to be a neuro-oncologist where clinical trials are a big part of the day-to-day, -day, I wanted to have a really firm background in uh, the understanding of uh, clinical trials and statistics and design and so forth. So that was where I really focused myself during my master's of public health time. In my um, free time during fellowship, uh, I did uh, increasing amounts of work with the American Academy of Neurology. I was on the graduate education subcommittee. Um, and then I began doing some work with the Society for Neuro-Oncology, which is uh, the subspecialty society uh, within the brain tumor world. And then finally, um, faculty. So uh, I, out of fellowship, um, they hired me on at the Mass General uh, I guess it's been about five and a half, six years um, at this point. And so I'll tell you a little bit about, I mean, I'm going to tell you a lot about neuro-oncology, but my day-to-day, -day, um, it, it feels like it's different from one week to the next. But in general, I would say I'm 40% patient care um, in, my, in my usual. And so that translates to something like um, eight hours of uh clinic time per week. Uh, of course, that always has spillover and so forth, but just generally speaking, um, I continue to do a fair amount of research, which is in large part collaborative. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I serve as both the clinical director for our 11 physician group, and so I do a lot of administrative work to make sure the trains run on time. Uh, and then I also serve as the overall director for our um, large neurofibromatosis clinic, which is the largest in the country. So there's a fair amount of uh, administrative work that goes into that as well. I do a lot of volunteering uh, with the American Academy of Neurology and others that I'll tell you a little bit about. And then teaching, of course, is a very important piece of my week. Um, I, it took me a lot to make this add up to 100% because sometimes it feels like it's more like 150% on a given week. Um, but Quite honestly, every one of these buckets is fulfilling in a variety of ways. And the mix here, although it changes from week to week, I think is what gets me out of bed every morning. I love the variety that I get to do through all of these different things that I've um, found a way to squeeze into my work week. Um, this is a picture of uh, a patient of mine. She, she um, you know, signed a, an agreement to, to have a photo shoot with us. And, 
Um, she, I, I, I've treated her for glioblastoma for the past year or two, uh, two years, and uh, it was one of the kindest things a patient had ever said to me while we were being interviewed for this photo shoot. Uh, she said, you know, what does your week look like and how many patients do you see? And I sort of told her and she said, you know, quite honestly, I thought I was your only patient with the amount of attention and, and kindness you've shown me, uh, which I think was about one of the nicest things that patients ever said, because clearly I have um, more than one. Um, so my research is very different now than it was when I was in a lab doing pipetting. Uh, and uh, it, Really, I love this. I love that I have found my way into something that is a very collaborative type of research. Um, I'll tell you, you know, when we talk more about neuro-oncology in a minute, I'll, you'll see similarly, I like teamwork, um, and that's what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day research life. Um, so I am the principal investigator currently on three therapeutic clinical trials for brain tumors, trying out new uh, chemotherapy agents for patients. Um, I'm also an investigator on 20 plus other trials that my colleagues are leading uh, at Mass General. Um, I have really moved from being the guy in the lab with the pipette to um, the very close clinical collaborator for smart people in the lab with the pipettes. Um, and so uh, I'm currently on you know three R01s. Um, that colleagues have acquired through the NIH to help bring um, the very, really important clinical information to um, basic science labs. And so I, I'll just give you an off the top of my head example. Um, if you're growing tumor cells in a dish and you identify a pathway that uh, looks like you could target it and there are three drugs um, that are available to target that pathway, this would be a very common discussion I would have with collaborators where I look at um, evidence that's come from those drugs and say, well, one of them causes um, you know, refractory diarrhea, one of them causes a terrible rash, and one of them tends to be fairly well tolerated. Why don't we try the well tolerated one first? Um, and then we can circle back as we understand whether the effect of that drug is as much as we're looking for. Something along those lines. Uh, and I also um, think that in so many parts of neurology research, uh, you have to have tissue, you have to have blood, you have to have brain tissue and, and tumor tissue. Uh, and so um, you, uh, those are my patients. So basic scientists really do need a clinical collaborator who sees the patients to ask for the samples uh, and to develop that, um, that rapport with the patients to say, yes, I'm willing to share uh, you know, my tissue with you for research purposes. Um, I also am still involved in quality improvement research. And um, just to give you a sense of like a recent project we've done, we identified that there's a correlation between uh, the turnaround for a type of molecular testing we do and how patient, patients overall survival, meaning, you know, uh, if we wait around for that information, it impacts their survival. And so we've done uh, a lot of quality improvement work to um, try to increase the turnaround or decrease the turnaround time uh, and thereby improve survival for patients. So that's the type of research that I do. Uh, I'm involved both within my institution and in a couple national organizations uh, in guideline development to try to determine what is best practice for treatment of different neuro-oncologic diseases. And then uh, lastly, I do uh, a fair amount of neurology education and pipeline research uh, with the Academy of Neurology, um, which is uh, also a very fulfilling role that I do uh, across institutions trying to um, improve opportunities um, for neurology education and um, uh, make sure that we have a sufficiently filled neurology pipeline of future neurologists. Um, so I'm glad that you're all here for that. Um, in terms of volunteer work, uh, I told you it, it's probably close to 20% of my week that I spend helping organizations. And this feels really important to me and I really like it a lot. So um, I do, I, I sit on multiple committees and subcommittees within the AAN and that is um, in terms of education and pipeline and political advocacy. 
uh, where I sit on the health policy subcommittee. I've gone to DC several times to lobby for neurology patients and physicians and research. Uh, I do sit on the board of directors for the United Council for Neurologic Subspecialties. That's the group that provides board certifications for a number of neurology subspecialties. Um, I sit on uh, one of the boards for the Children's Tumor Foundation, which is a neurofibromatosis um, committee where I help with guideline development there. I sit on the guideline committee um, with Society for Neuro-Oncology and I actually sit on the board of directors for a local NF um, advocacy group. And you know, the, this is all uh, volunteer work that generally I, I get into my you know, work week at between the eight and five hours, I, I try to find time to do these so I don't take away from family very much. But I, I find it um, really rewarding to be able to help, especially in these nonprofits, um, to help advance their missions, which are uh, parallel with my own personal missions. Um, sometimes people think of consulting as sort of dirty, but I, I, find, I think it's important. I mean, uh, we have a bunch of students here and this is the real world. And Quite honestly, I don't think this is dirty at all. Um, just like there are nonprofit um, organizations that are trying to advance um, efforts to improve care, there are for-profit organizations that are also have similar goals um, to improve care. And so, uh, for instance, I currently sit on the scientific advisory board for a very small pharma company that has one drug uh, that they're trying to bring into a disease that I treat commonly. And when it's such a small shop, they desperately need um, people who are knowledgeable in the field about how to go about testing their hypothesis with their drug. Um, they very much want to be able to help the lives of patients that I treat. And so um, I do that um, sometimes on the side. And then I also have uh, been helping a couple health tech startups that are focused on uh, improving the experience of patients who are getting treatment for cancer and so forth. So um, these are um, similar sort of side projects that I work on uh, that uh, again sort of adds to the variety and the fun of what I do. And then believe it or not, um, I fit the vast majority of all of that into 40, 45 hours a week. Uh, I, I do take a lot of time for family and, and other things. So. Um, I have an amazing wife and four-year-old daughter. This is six months ago. She was a little bit younger. And we love traveling. Um, my kid's been all over. She's great on an airplane. She's um, great in a hotel room. So um, really lucky to uh, have their support uh, while I do all this. And we're both, we're all three desperately missing travel during COVID. Um, I enjoy kayaking and boating, and uh, there's a lot of uh, beautiful places to go do that here in the, uh, in the Massachusetts area. And then I like to paint, um, which is just something that I do in my free time, which has been more copious during um, the pandemic. Okay, um, so that was probably more than you actually wanted to know about me, but hopefully some of it was interesting. Uh, let's talk about neuro-oncology. Um, which as I began with is clearly the best subspecialty and I, you just aren't aware of it yet. So let me get started. So the top five things I love about Neuronc, and there are many, uh, first of all, it's multidisciplinary teamwork every day. Uh, and I really think that the fun of what I do is um, so heavily weighed, uh, weighed upon by my amazing colleagues in a variety of different, different specialties. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, it's really art more than science, uh, what we do. Clearly there are clinical trials and we try to do as much data driven as possible, but compared to uh, colleagues in stroke, for instance, where they have a very um, algorithmic type of approach for a patient who walks in, I, uh, um, and that's not to belittle that at all. I think that's helpful. But in neuro-oncology, for a variety of reasons, uh, I would say that there comes to be a lot more art as we determine uh, how best to help a patient who's suffering from a, a neurologic tumor. Um, the relationships with patients and families uh, is unlike anything I had when I was doing general neurology with clinics and residency. Um, you know, when mortality is on the line, unfortunately, uh, that really strengthens a bond very quickly. 
uh, with a provider and patient and family. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, the number of times that a patient has told me, you know, if you told me to uh, chew glass and it might help my tumor, I would, I would do whatever you told me to do, doc. Um, it just, it's really heartwarming. Uh, you know, the, the true flip side is it's also heartbreaking uh, if and when a patient dies, and that does happen in this, in this uh, arena. Uh, but I, I think that the reward of the relationships is worth that. Um, clinical trials, I love. I'll tell you a little bit about clinical trials here in a minute. I think, you know, the only way to advance science, uh, especially for incurable diseases, is to just keep trying new and new ideas and learn from what you've um, completed. So we do a lot of clinical trial work in my field. Um, and then lastly, there's a wide variety of diseases. Um, there are certainly, you know, the, the top hits, most common types of uh, diseases that I'll tell you about today, but every patient's different. The molecular analysis of everyone's tumor is different. And so there's really a lot of variety for what I do. So, Neuro-oncology care is incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, and this is a smattering of the types of people that I work with every single week. Uh, and, and quite literally, I just hung up a call um, for our weekly tumor board that included everybody on this list. Um, so every single patient who comes in um, gets presented to neurosurgeons and radiation doctors and, and neuro-oncologists uh, we often have early palliative care intervention, depending on the patient and the situation. Uh, and um, I really think that that provides a better experience for patients and selfishly for me too. Uh, it used to be that we would all crowd commonly into um, a big team room at least once a week so that we could have these meetings. Now we just have endless Zoom meetings like all the rest of you do. Um, and you know, I told you the variety is large. Uh, the big categories for what we do in a given day um, in neuro-oncology, um, metastatic brain tumors are, of course, the most common uh, brain tumors. Um, primary brain tumors, uh, such as astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas and a variety of uh, glioblastomas. Um, perineoplastic disorders, uh, do fall under neuro-oncology in some instances, in some institutions and others, they fall under neuroinflammatory disease, but certainly this is a, a common part of our job. Um, then tumors that grow outside of brain and spine, like uh, nerve sheath tumors and dural-based tumors like meningiomas, of course, are very common. And then uh, I would say that there's a small sect of neuro-oncologists uh, neuro who do this, but hereditary uh, syndromes that cause nervous system tumors like neurofibromatosis. Uh, it turns out to be a big part of my week. So one of the things that I really uh, also liked as I was looking across subspecialties in neurology and thinking about uh, what I liked is the, the truth is um, a neuro-oncology visit includes lots and lots of different subspecialties. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, I'm going to pick on my stroke friends when I mean no disrespect, but, you know, when you're in a stroke clinic visit, you know, you're going to check on your antiplatelet or your, um, you know, make sure that your risk factors with cholesterol and blood pressure and so forth, they're handled and then you're sort of done. In a brain tumor visit, um, you know, I'm going to make sure we give you your next cycle of chemotherapy. We're going to address the constipation and nausea that we gave you with the chemotherapy. Maybe your blood counts were low. Uh, we're going to talk about the fatigue that's associated with your cancer, and I might treat you for that with modafinil or Ritalin or something. Um, good chance you have seizures, so I'll be titrating your anti-epileptics. Good chance you have headaches, and so I'll be titrating your anti-headache medicines. Uh, for some of the diseases we treat, um, there are neuropathies, including chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, and so I'll be working on the medication to impact your, uh, to reduce your nervous system pain. Um, of course, in the big picture, everyone's coping with a, a tremendous, uh, tremendously difficult disease. And so uh, we do a lot of coping and, ther and therapy um, oversells what I'm actually able to do. But, you know, certainly we talk about um, all of those important overarching topics. I take every opportunity with a patient visit to do some education about their disease, about the research that's going on in their disease, to bring them hope. 
Uh, and then any time that there's a research opportunity, whether it's a, a therapeutic clinical trial, um, contributing their existing tumor tissue to a research study that's going on or anything else like that, um, we talk about those. So you can see that a, a single visit in the neuro-oncology space covers a huge amount of, uh, of neurology in general. So I really like that. I get to feel like a neurologist, even though I'm, I'm a um, very subspecialized uh, neurologist. And what that translates to uh, is this sort of Rorschach of um, specialties where within neurology, I feel like I'm doing a whole heck of a lot of these things. I talk routinely about uh, neuroinflammatory, the edema in the head and the dexamethasone dosing and the various things we do for that. I, eye exam is very important for us when we're thinking about people who have leptomeningeal disease and the cranial nerves being involved. Uh, neuromuscular, because of the neuropathy we talked about, there's certainly people are at risk of infectious disease after they have brain surgery when they're on chemotherapy. Uh, you know, judgment and cognition are, can be severely impacted in certain types of uh, tumors and locations. And then even outside of neurology, um, certainly I wear uh, a disguise that looks like an oncologist um, in the hospital where I have close friends in breast oncology and thoracic oncology, and we speak very similar languages sometimes. Uh, I, genetics, especially in my neurofibromatosis role, uh, I do a lot of counseling in terms of genetics and family planning and so forth in my clinic. Uh, palliative medicine, you name it. Um, I really think neuro-oncology's got it. I hope I'm convincing you all. That was sort of what I was setting out to do, so. Okay. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about clinical trials, which is bread and butter neuro-oncology. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have cures for the vast majority of the, of the diseases we treat. They're not all dismal survival, um, but they're not curable. Um, and so uh, the path to improve that outcome, uh, to improve any outcome is through clinical trials. And I suspect that many of you may be like me when I was in med school where I didn't really know much about clinical trials other than they test whether drugs work or not. So I just thought I'd spend two minutes talking about that. So um, basically, this is a roadmap for a drug. So a phase one study is when you have a new compound, maybe first in human, maybe first time you combine it with another drug, and you really um, set a primary endpoint of making sure you have a safe drug and figuring out the right dose of that drug or that combination of drugs. Um, and so generally phase ones are done with extremely small numbers of patients um, because if you're truly just looking to understand safety and dosing, you don't need to expose a whole heck of a lot of a patients to a drug that may or may not work. Um, and this study is not designed to determine that. So um, you may do as few as nine or 15 patients um, on a clinical, on a phase one study. You say, okay, we figured out that Dose level three is the best dose. It's tolerated by the majority of patients and the side effects were X, Y, and Z. And then um, you do look as a secondary outcome at how people did. So you'd say, oh, and we also happen to look and among the patients who were on this study, X percent seemed like they did better than they would have done or their tumors shrank in, in an amazing circumstance. Um, and so Although the study is never powered for whether it works or not on the tumor, you always look for that tiny hint that maybe what you're doing is worthwhile. Whereas if you ran a phase one and um, every patient had their tumor grow faster than you would have expected by, by just um, natural history, then you have to step back and say, hmm, maybe we have a problem here. A phase two is a sort of strange intermediary where you, you have a drug you understand the safety profile for and the dosing for. You have a suspicion based on pre-existing data from the lab that it may be helpful for a given diagnosis. And you want to expose um, a, enough patients to get a, a sense of whether it works or not, but not so many patients that you put them at risk for a non-helpful drug. And so um, this says 100 to 300. I would say in neuro-oncology, it's probably smaller than that. It's more like 30 to 50 um, for most phase twos. They're single arm, they don't compare to anything usually, and you just, uh, except for like natural history, 
and then you um, say, okay, compared to natural history, we want, you know, 20%, 50% of these patients to live longer than we would expect on natural history or have their tumor stable longer than we would expect with natural history. And then assuming that you continue to have a positive signal, um, then you run your usual phase three, which of course is a randomized controlled um, trial where you um, give patients either the standard of care uh, or the treatment. We certainly never use placebos in cancer care though. Um, you would just use another standard. And that's, that's where you um, seek your regulatory um, approval. You say, FDA, we think we really have a drug here that's gonna work. We've compared it to uh, the standard of care and we found that it's better and now can we please have an indication? So that's sort of the, the big um, picture with clinical trials. I hope that wasn't too boring. So um, neuro-oncology is certainly in the news. Many of you have probably um, seen these things and they sort of fly by um, in politics, which I pay a lot of attention to. Of course, John McCain, Ted Kennedy, Bo Biden, all unfortunately passed away from glioblastomas, um, which is uh, very sad, um, but has also led to uh, a little bit of a renewed focus on research dollars from Congress. Um, which may be an, a downstream consequence of, of those uh, big losses. Um, Maria Menudo has a meningioma, and she's been very outspoken about that. Cheryl Crow had a meningioma. Um, metastatic brain tumors, you know, Jimmy Carter, I forgot to put on here uh, as well, but, you know, there are a variety of people um, over time have had these. So certainly um, neuro-oncology is everywhere in the news if you're looking for it. Um, before I start talking about individual diseases, I wanted to sort of lay the big picture groundwork in neuro-oncology, which is um, that we have really gone from a field of lumpers, where we say you have a high-grade glioma, you have an astrocytoma, um, to a field of splitters. Um, and this is because of genetics, this is because of methylomics, this is because of proteome. Um, so the more and more technical advances we get um, that are able to be done in the lab in a relatively quick fashion, um, the more we can translate that to um, really fine-tuned types of tumors. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the types of treatments that, that we're thinking about in terms of clinical trials, but especially in the era of targeted therapy, where we're taking small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors and trying to block an overactive pathway, clearly you need to know what's driving this individual tumor's growth uh, before you try to um, use a drug like that. So um, in reality, we no longer talk about high-grade gliomas and low-grade gliomas, um, or even you know astrocytomas. We talk about is it an IDH mutant tumor or an IDH wild type tumor? Is it 1P19Q intact or codeleted? Is it an H3K27M mutation? And so um, at first glance, it almost sounds like speaking in some bizarre code um, and you know, could be uh, a little bit sort of overwhelming, but the truth is this is an amazing revolution in our ability to understand each individual patient in front of us and help um, craft the best treatment for them. And so back when I said neuro-oncology is increasingly, or, or, or is um, art greater than science to some extent, uh, it's because it's nearly impossible to design a trial for IDH mutant 1P19Q co-deleted TERP promoter mutant C uh, GSEMP high patients. Like once you get to such a small number of people, uh, it gets hard to enroll to a point where you can get an answer. And so um, much of what we do is try to use um, parallel sources of knowledge uh, where uh, if somebody has a CDK into a mutation, until we're able to develop a trial and ask the question in an outright way, maybe we'll use a CDK into a uh, targeting drug that exists already for breast cancer because that's a well-known targeted uh, uh, driver pathway there. So that's sort of the idea of what we try to do for these patients. Okay, so uh, glioblastoma is the most common primary brain tumor in adults. You'll notice that um, a lot of these tumors, it seems like they're all vying to be the most popular. Um, and so they all carry a tagline like that. Um, so whereas metastases are the most common brain tumors, these are the most common primary brain tumors in adults. 
Um, and certainly this is uh, absolute bread and butter neuro-oncology. Um, unfortunately, these are also very aggressive terminal um, incurable diseases. And so uh, while this is bread and butter, these are, these are the particularly tough ones. Um, when, when a, a run-of-the-mill IDH wild-type glioblastoma um, is diagnosed. And so when we treat these, um, we always uh, work with our neurosurgical colleagues and try to operate and remove as much tumor as possible before we begin treatment. Um, and then we use a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. I don't know if you've ever seen how cranial radiation is given, uh, but because of the importance of, of providing radiation um, only to the area where you want it and sparing the healthy brain, um, they make a mask for every patient that fits their head, connects to the machine, holds them in place, and then they deliver the radiation externally. Um, so we combine radiation and chemotherapy. There's also this device that's newly FDA approved for glioblastoma. It's called the Optune device. Happy to debate the science about that on the side. I wouldn't say it's a home run, um, but uh, it, it's the first in its kind, first of its kind in terms of uh, an externally worn device um, for this tumor. Um, and then in terms of chemo strategies, there's a whole host of things that we think about. So I would say standard of care um, that you get at any place, uh, USA or any place in the world, um, probably focuses primarily on a cytotoxic, a cytotoxic agent with temozolomide. Um, this is uh, the current standard of care that was published, unfortunately, 15 years ago. Um, highlighting the fact that a whole lot of advances haven't been made in terms of um, treatment here. Uh, and so I would say cytotoxic chemotherapies, which are alkylating uh, nitrosurias, are uh, by far the most common that we um, prescribe in our clinic. But increasingly, we try to use targeted therapies, um, either targeting a genetic or a pathway alteration. So uh, for instance, I had a patient last week who falls into the 2% of glioblastomas that have a BRAF mutation. Um, and BRAF happens to, have very, it happens to be very targetable. Um, there are melanoma approved drugs that uh, hit that exact mutation and can shrink tumors. And so uh, although no glioblastoma is good, we were just so relieved to see that he had that mutation for which we have a nice targeted therapy. Um, we use MEK inhibitors, we use EGFR inhibitors, CDK and 2A I told you about. So a variety of targeted um, therapies based on molecular profiling of tumors that we're doing. Uh, we will use biologics, um, which is primarily antibodies. Um, certainly a VEGF inhibitor is the most common that we use. The, the uh, most common of those is bevacizumab. Um, the idea for that is that it uh, actually normalizes the abnormal blood vessels in a brain tumor and reduces swelling and inflammation and so forth. Um, and we have used some biologics uh, to try to kill tumor cells as well, such as with antibody drug conjugates. So you take an antibody and on the end, you tack on a little cytotoxic um, molecule, and then hopefully that goes to a cell that it's targeting and gets um, taken into the cell and kills the cell. And then uh, lastly, the, the whole world of um, oncology, if you follow those sorts of things, is really uh, turning toward immunotherapy and neuro-oncology is no different. So we're doing things like PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, oncolytic viruses, where we, uh, at the time of a surgery, um, inject virus into the brain that has um, a tropism for the tumor cells and can kill the tumor cells. So a variety of immunotherapy um, strategies that we're pursuing as well. So really, uh, it's a huge variety of, of um, chemotherapies that we have available to us in our, in our tool chest for glioblastomas. Um, lower grade gliomas uh, account for a significant proportion of the population that we see in our clinic. <clears throat> and that's the old nomenclature. In reality, they're just IDH mutant tumors, which translates to people living a lot longer um, and having less necrosis, mitosis under the microscope and so forth. So the big categories of IDH mutant tumors are um, either diffuse astrocytomas or oligodendrogliomas. Uh, these uh, on average are diagnosed at a younger age. They have um, longer survival than, than glioblastoma, but 
unfortunately do remain uh, incurable today. Um, and so, you know, it's always such a double-edged sword. When you get uh, a lower grade glioma, you stop, you, you think, oh, geez, at least it's not, you know, this individual is not going to pass away very quickly. But then you look and the patient is the same age as you and you think, man, this is a 10 year survival. It's, it's a little bit different. So um, the hope in all of that is uh, research has just taken off in terms of IDH mutant tumors. Um, there are a, a handful of IDH inhibitors now uh, that we are using in clinical trials that have really begun to revolutionize the field. And so when I have newly diagnosed patients now with a tumor that would previously have had a 10-year survival, I say, you know, here's the data we have today that says it's likely a 10-year survival. But the reality is that the survival is probably increasing every year as we get through these clinical trials. So once we get to 10 years, it's, I have no doubt in my mind that we'll have lots of new options available um, to keep you alive longer. Um, and then uh, the other piece of lower grade gliomas, whereas the survival is longer, um, there's a lot of survivorship um, considerations. And so these people will have had radiation um, with potential consequences as a result and chemotherapy with neuropathy as a result. They have family planning and maybe they were, uh, maybe their fertility was impacted by chemotherapy. And so you planned ahead for that. So there's a variety of additional things you get to think about as you work with these people over years and years and years. Meningiomas, uh, again, vying for some uh, for a superlative here. Most common intracranial tumor uh, in adults. You'll notice that it's not a brain tumor because it does sit outside the brain, of course. Um, this is incredibly common. I, I mean, um, among all of you on the call, you know, probably three of your grandparents have one, and they're completely benign um, for the vast majority of people and indolent. Um, and so. This 2% incidence in the population that we talk about is based on autopsy studies. So people who die of infections and heart attacks and strokes, and we do an autopsy and we say, oh, that person had a meningioma, they didn't know. Um, when people find their way into our clinic, um, clearly it, some of them are incidental findings, but increasingly uh, they, you know, they may have symptoms. So like this person here who probably has left leg weakness and maybe left leg seizures, uh, and so uh, that's when we begin to think about how to, should we and how do we treat. I will say um, for an asymptomatic incidental finding, though, that the preferred treatment is still observe uh, because the, the vast majority of these are benign and, and may not cause any problems. Uh, the picture here on the bottom is just to point out that um, there's increasing amount of work being done in um, uh, meningioma genetics as well. And so surprisingly, uh, we've identified that there is a propensity for location based on driver mutation in some of these. And so, um, you know, this may not feel all that helpful today that if you see an olfactory groove meningioma, you might um, think to yourself, oh, that's a smoothened mutation meningioma, except uh, you'll be happy to learn that we have smoothened inhibitors. Um, and so if you have somebody who has a tumor there and they may not have a good option for operation, uh, now we have, uh, you know, potentially directed therapies that we could use. And so th that type of research is going on too. Um, just a couple more diseases I wanted to walk through. CNS lymphoma is, uh, it, sometimes it feels like it's raining CNS lymphoma, which is a disease that I didn't even know about in med school. Um, but we just get so much of this here. Um, and it can happen... Uh, either as a primary CNS lymphoma, so the, the lymphoma originates in the brain or spine or spinal fluid, um, or more commonly, it's secondary. So somebody who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in their body and it goes to the brain as a site of metastasis. Um, in the world of lymphoma, we call the CNS, the brain, the spine, the nerves, the spinal fluid, and the eyes. The vitreous can actually be involved um, with lymphoma cells. Uh, and so all of those things are uh, evaluated for the presence of, of lymphoma when we uh, begin treating. Um, this is, uh, again, nobody's ever happy to have any brain tumor, but uh, if you get a new patient with lymphoma, it feels like a, um, a positive compared to other types of tumors because we have great treatments. These happen to respond really well to chemotherapy. So you can see before on the top and after on the bottom 
um, there's a 70% response rate for methotrexate-based therapies for lymphoma. So you give them high-dose methotrexate in their veins um, for two or three months, and you, be, you may be able to get their skin completely clean. Um, we, all, we continue to tr uh, investigate how best to keep the lymphoma away once you get it gone. Uh, because it does have a risk of recurrence. And so there are a number of trials going on for that. This is also um, the field of, the, of neuro-oncology where we work really closely with the hematology team and, and the hemonc team uh, because we do things like stem cell transplants um, for these patients in order to keep the lymphoma away or if it recurs. And I don't know uh, if many of you are aware of CAR T cell therapy, so chimeric antigen receptor T cells where they um, actually uh, rearrange the, the receptors on the T cells. They take your own T cells um, and fix the genetic problem basically, and then put them back in after uh, cytoreductive chemotherapy. And these then go on and essentially replace the existing T cells that may put you at risk of recurrent lymphoma. Um, so we have, uh, uh, again, this is sort of the multidisciplinary aspect, but um, we've made enormous headway in terms of treatment of lymphoma with really uh, promising treatments now and on the horizon. And then uh, the last disease I thought I would talk a little bit about is neurofibromatosis, uh, which is really a, a family. Um, neuro, the neurofibromatoses are uh, hereditary syndromes uh, that uh, are autosomal dominant and have a risk for multiple types of tumors. So uh, NF1, as we call uh, neurofibromatosis type 1, is by far the more common. Um, this person has cutaneous neurofibromas on their hand and probably over their whole body. That's the most common type of tumor. But these individuals are at increased risk for sarcomas and breast cancers and brain tumors um, and a variety of other things. So it's uh, really a whole body disease. NF2 uh, which is a misnomer because uh, there actually are no neurofibromas in the disease. I'm actually working on a panel internationally to rename this disease. Um, NF2 is associated with uh, hearing nerve tumors, bilateral vestibular schwannomas that can cause premature deafness, facial weakness, and so forth, as well as a variety of other types of tumors. This person also has a meningioma here in the um, temporal fossa. Um, and then, uh, just because I thought it was a cool picture primarily, um, there's this idea of genetic mosaicism where an individual born to parents without neurofibromatosis um, may have a somatic mutation while they're in gestation. Um, and so you can, in this person in particular, you can actually see where the NF1 mutations are and where they're not. Um, it doesn't always um, present so beautifully, but there's a lot of um, sort of genetic think in my day-to-day -day, um, in the NF clinic. Um, and just like I showed you in my brain tumor clinic, the NF clinic, um, the agenda looks a little bit different in there in that uh, we, we may or may not treat. Um, most of those tumors I just showed you are non-malignant, and so sometimes the best choice is observation, depending on the tumor and the location. Uh, but there's a high number of uh, cognitive problems with NF1. <clears throat> there's the cancer risk that we talked about. Uh, they suffer from headaches. Pain is common. We do a lot of family planning because these are hereditary autosomal dominant disorders. Uh, coping, education, research. And so, again, I get a very um, uh, a wide variety of interactions that I get to have with patients when I see them in clinic. This is just to show you that um, by, by no means is this all uh, that, I'm, that I'm seeing uh, in clinic. These are just a, a number of the other tumors that we see, including metastases. Uh, clearly very, very common in neuro-oncology. I didn't go into the details today, but um, by far uh, the busiest part of a neuro-oncology practice in, in many cases. Okay, um, just a couple more slides. I just wanted to tell you that the fellowship for neuro-oncology uh, is one year of clinical training, and that's all you require to um, sit for board certification. Uh, many of the fellowships around the country do have uh, the possibility of one or two additional years of research um, that are either grant funded or institutionally funded. And, and uh, I would say that it's probably uh, more likely than not that most uh, fellows are doing additional years of research. Not looked down upon if you don't, though. Um, Neuro-oncology fellowship is unique in that 
most patients and uh, most uh, trainees coming through a neurologist, but we do occasionally have a medical oncologist who's already done medicine, already done oncology, and then wants to do a fellowship in neuro-oncology specifically. Um, there is a board certification, and I failed to mention that there's also a match. Uh, for the last two years, we've had a match uh, for neuro-oncology. So um, that's all I had, uh, and I hope that there's some time for questions here. Um, it looks like there's some in the chat, perhaps. Oh, um, so Ariana said, what are some examples of the type of quality improvement research you conducted? How would one get involved in that type of research? Um, so I think that probably a great way to get involved in quality improvement research is <clears throat> to look at guidelines that are published or quality metrics that are published. The, the American Academy of Neurology does publish for all subspecialties. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you an example outside of neuro-oncology. Um, the guidelines for new neuropathy, uh, if somebody comes to a neurologist for new neuropathy, say everyone should get a hemoglobin A1C checked because the, the likelihood is so high that it's a diabetic etiology. And so a good quality improvement project would be to look through everybody who has a diagnosis code of neuropathy in the, your medical record and verify that they also have an A1C on record. Um, and if not, it's already published that, that's, that that is the best type of care you can give to a patient with neuropathy. Um, and so you could then do a project locally to try to increase the number of patients, the proportion of patients who are getting that test. That, that's sort of an off the top um, example. Um, Roxana said, how do you transition from basic science research to clinical trial research? Did you seek out additional training as part of your transition? Yeah, so, um, it, when one does a fellowship that is in a field with a lot of clinical trials, you get a lot of exposure to that research during your fellowship. Um, so, you know, it, it, on, clinical trials are very closely regulated. And so you have to report back to the sponsoring organization or the FDA, uh, any type of side effect a patient might have, let's say. And so fellows, um, just like med students and residents are very involved in taking phone calls and overnight calls. And so if a patient calls and says, I have a bloody nose, uh, and I'm taking a clinical trial medication, then the fellows get trained and they learn how to you know, do the appropriate reporting to the appropriate people. That's sort of the earliest exposure. And then we, you, know, you have a, a fellow who says, you know, I might like to um, write clinical trials in the future. And uh, you know, at most organizations, if trials are happening, you say like, oh, great. I happen to be writing a protocol right now about a new drug. Would you like to help me with that? And we can um, sort of go through that together. My MPH also included um, a couple of classes on clinical trial design, but I do not think that that's uh, an absolutely necessary piece if, that's, uh, if you wanna be involved in clinical research. Um, and how does compensation work for the R01s for your clinical collaborator, as well as the clinical trials your principal investigator for? How much does your consult, okay. Um, so, I should say that uh, there are incredibly strict rules for consulting and for uh, all of these things. So consulting is completely separate. I don't represent the institution. I don't represent AAN. I, I'm Justin Jordan as an individual and I give opinions um, to these, uh, you know, the health tech startups and so forth. That's all, that's all outside of work. Um, R01s, um, basically I get a small uh, stipend uh, of salary support. So when you tell the NIH, um, you know, your budget, you say that Dr. Jordan is going to give us 2.5% uh, of every week for the next five years. Um, and these are the things that he's going to do with a statement of work. And it's, you know, collect tissues, educate patients, get clinical corollary information. Um, and then the hospital receives that money from the NIH and they apply it to my salary. Uh, Priya says, what are your thoughts on going into neuro-oncology from an oncology track versus a neurology track? Um, it's a loaded question, Priya. Are you already an oncologist? <laughs> um, assuming not. Uh, I, I showed you the list of what I accomplish in every neuro-oncology visit, which in addition to prescribing chemotherapy includes control of seizures and headaches and neuropathy and so forth. I think that um, the knowledge I came with neurology uh, into this field is enormously beneficial for my patients. <clears throat> I, clearly a medical oncologist can learn those things, but I, I think that 
the ability to localize and to just know um, seizure medicines like the back of your hand and their interactions like you learn at 2 a.m. as a neurology resident uh, is just uh, unbelievably important. Um, but uh, admittedly, my medical oncology trained neuro-oncology colleagues uh, have a much better handle when we come into side effects of uh, hematologic toxicity and so forth. So there are certainly benefits to both. I'm happy I came the way I came. Dr. Jordan. Hi. Hey, Christy. Um, I was wondering, you talked about how you did an MPH for like, and you got more comfortable with like statistics. Um, would you suggest as like as a third year medical student that we seek out those opportunities and then like also you said you had an extra year to be more comfortable with bench research. Would you recommend doing a PhD like what kind of would you recommend just doing it the way you did it kind of after or if you had been a third year medical student and knew you wanted to do neuro oncology would you have changed course. Like yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think by the time I was a third year med student. I probably mostly knew uh, and I had similar discussions with the PI I was working with at MD Anderson about, you know, should I just do a PhD at the same time? Um, she was at MD only um, and was doing amazingly well running a basic science lab with our ones. I'm not doing all of that, but I feel very comfortable as an MD um, doing the collaborative research I'm doing. I don't think that giving an additional three to five years for a PhD is necessary. Um, certainly it comes with benefits, um, certainly street cred first, um, which is important, uh, knowledge about all the techniques that I didn't do during my one year of time in the lab. You know, I, I couldn't tell you how to run an ELISA with experience and how to troubleshoot one. I can tell you how to troubleshoot Westerns and um, sequencing and so forth because I did that. And I think when you get into um, studying the veracity of data, understanding what can go wrong and will go wrong and how to fix it is important. So I think it just matters. Uh, I think it's so hard to plan now for 10 years from now, I realize that. Um, unless you really see yourself as an 80% bench person, 20% lab, where you think that you know, your salary is gonna come from the NIH primarily and you wanna have five technicians working under you in the lab, uh, unless you're there, I don't know that an, a PhD is a necessary um, tack on at this point. Um, the MPH uh, was also incredibly helpful. I, I'm going to say something that's a little controversial. I don't know that I would spend money on it. Um, meaning like if you can find a program that will pay for it for you and you have the time in your life to do it, then that's great. But if you're going to shell out $90,000 to go um, for an additional 18 months of training to be more comfortable with statistics and clinical trials, there are probably other ways to accomplish that. It just so happens that my, my um, university and, and the grant I was on paid for the, the study for me, uh, which I am incredibly grateful for. I mean, I did learn an enormous amount, but I, th I don't know that it's a necessary expense to incur. Um, Jessica White said, uh, do you focus solely on neuro-oncology? I've seen a neuro-onc physician also treat migraine patients to fill her schedule, as is common. Uh, it depends on where you're working and what your RVU targets look like and what your payment structure looks like. Uh, where I am, we have 11 neuro-oncologists and we're all far too busy. Um, so seeing only brain tumors. Um, so I think that uh, I don't do that, but I certainly do know colleagues uh, who cover a little bit on the general neurology service or um, any uh, other options like that. So it just depends on where you go to work. Um, Marion started med school this year, uh, kind of young. I'm already in a neurology research group. What would you recommend me doing during uh, all my student time if I'd like to be a neuro-oncologist? Um, I think it's a balance. I mean, I think uh, in general, you want to keep your exposure broad um, so that you make sure that you, you know, it's really what you want to do, but um, probably meet a neuro-oncologist wherever you are and see if there's a research project you could contribute to, um, even if it's just chart reviews or a literature review, um, trying to build up um, the knowledge and the connections and your CV to, to demonstrate that interest. It's not an absolutely necessary thing. If somebody decides uh, at the end of their third year of residency they want to do neuro-oncology, they're also more than welcome to do so. Uh, but if you feel that early, um, Marion, that you strongly want to become a neuro-oncologist, I, I would suggest um, trying to put those things on your CV if you can identify mentors that would help you with that. 